we have a problem with these Zamazamas because when we go to work, they go and they rape our wives and our daughters and we must do something about them. I saw with my own eyes the Harbiersfontein office block was broken down within a month, level with the ground. And if I say level with the ground, I mean they were not one brick on another brick. They uh, dig up all the cables and the whole area. You've waited too long, and now the results are getting out of hand. Let's take the uh, construction mafia, for instance, the water mafia. Uh, I want to say there are so many mafias. I mean, the Zama Zamas, it's part of the gold mafia, if you can want to put it that way. Because I'm also told that there you have people involved in high positions in politics. I've never been a miner, but I am told. What is happening now, these pillars hold some of the very rich, uh, uh, can I say, gold uh, offsets in those pillars. And now they're mining out those pillars. And now you can imagine what is going, the ceiling is start falling in. And I live in... Guys, this whole Zama Zama issue is actually another complex problem uh, I'm beginning to really slowly understand in South Africa. It's another ticking time bomb waiting to explode in South Africa. So I've been doing a short research on the whole origin of the Zama Zama and this uh, research actually is actually murky, it's kind of like blurry. But um, I was really surprised to really discover that, uh, you know, one of my favorite ministers at the GNU, Peter Grunwald, um, you know, I didn't know that he was actually once the uh, mayor of this steel fountain where the Zama Zamas are actually stuck now. Guys, this whole Zama Zama issue is another ticking time bomb waiting to explode in South Africa. Uh, I've begun just a really brief research on the origins of this whole Zama Zama problem and its history in South Africa. And, um, you know, the information is actually blurry and blur, you know, murky. And so um, I was really fortunate to have actually stumbled on this video where this is one of my really favorite ministers in the government of national unity, um, Minister of Correctional Services, uh, Pieter Grunwald. I didn't know that he was actually uh, the former mayor of Steel Fontaine at the point. And he really has a really interesting understanding of of the root causes of this whole Zama Zama problem. I think that's what we're going to really get in this video as he really tries to analyze the roots and you know where the whole zama zama issue comes from and how he even ascertains that the zama zama problem is a part of the gold mafia and that south africa is made up of mafias you see there are mafias in taxi there are mafias in roads there are mafias in the police there's mafia in uh, you know everywhere and i didn't expect that even on the ground you know in this in the whole mining industry there will be mafias so what peter Grun will call the gold mafias so I think it's really going to be really interesting to really learn from his perspective on how he understands this whole Zama Zama issue and what it speaks, you know, f for the future of South Africa going forward. Because I think it's a problem that if it's not carefully addressed, especially in a land that is, you know, so rich in gold and all that, I think it will really speak you know spiral negatively downwards into something that we might not um, be able to escape we saw you know the shocking news from that the whole world was shocked when the minister and the presidency i think her name is uh you know uh kumbutsu Chaveni, when she spoke about that she would smoke them out i really wondered why she made that statement because i thought that these were miners who really just were kind of like you know working in the mines but until uh, the police started reporting sub started reporting in the news you know, that these guys are armed to the feet. Some of them have, uh, you know, I think AK-47s on the ground. And that some of them are actually are sometimes close to 4,000 people on the ground. It's almost like an army, you see. And you can imagine if that army is really armed to the teeth and how, you know, that critical mass can actually become a force uh, to reckon with. So these are kind of like really critical issues that actually are sensitive to the, you know, you know, to the strength and uh, emergence of South Africa, especially in the future. And so that's why I think this Zama Zama issue um, is something that we should really carefully analyze. And I really want us to engage in a really robust discussion in this video. Uh, but before we go to uh, Peter Grunwald's, uh, Dr. Peter Grunwald's um, analysis and of especially his diagnosis of the problem of the Zama Zama issue, I found some really interesting videos from the unions, um, the unions leaders. I think this is uh, actually one uh, leader of the union. I think the name of this union is actually, it's a union in charge of mines 
and construction workers, Joseph uh, Matundua. I think he has a really interesting diagnosis as well. He takes this whole problem back to Marikana at some point and, and trying to really bring out that whole um, need to reskill the mine, the mine workers who were actually disenfranchised from their previous uh, artisanal mining skills and all that and, and blames the whole problem uh, with the government. Let's take a quick listen to how this union boss actually diagnoses the root causes of this Zama Zama issue. Uh, Mr. Matunjwa, the commentary from the minister in the presidency, to quote her directly, we're not sending help to criminals. Criminals are to be persecuted. We are going to smoke them out. What do you make of those comments? I think it's very fortunate that you are conducting these interviews. This is the same government when the workers on the 16th of August 2012 were fighting for the living wage at Marikane, and then they called the workers as criminals. I don't know now how can they be able to distinguish between criminals and workers. So workers were mowed down, 34 mine workers were killed, fighting for economic emancipation by the very same government. And today they've got guts to say, let's smoke them out, uh, those criminals. The same government have made this environment very fatal for illegal mining. We've been calling as AMCO that why can't you, uh, what's name, uh, reskill, empower all these former mine workers who are being retrenched by these big companies, your Anglo, your Sibanye, all these multi-international thieves that are looting the minerals of the country and living a depleted environment to give them artisanal mining, to empower them. They've got skills. We are sitting over 32.9% of unemployment in South Africa. I'm not talking about SADC as such. So those people, remember, uh, 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 those countries are the labor sending areas who's been here in South Africa for years yeah. with these skills. So do you think if the environment is created by this incompetent government, you think those people, they cannot use their skills to go and search for um, I mean for food yes and then there's also um, another union uh, uh, you know leader his name is Philip Mangi I think he's the uh, National uh, uh, Union of Mines he's from the National Union of Mines he's a leader in the National Union of Mine Workers I think in South Africa and he really speaks about you know he takes this problem to the perspective of you know the comparison between these artisanal miners who are Africans and then the Chinese miners he argues that the Chinese are actually in South Africa mining gold illegally but when the country, when the government tries to criticize them, uh, you know, especially these artisanal miners now who are stuck on the ground, they are, the Chinese are actually called investors while these guys, uh, you know, the, the black um, miners from Ma Maputo and Mozambique, I think, are usually called Zamazamas. But he says that the Chinese and the, these black miners actually are doing this. And let's really quickly listen to this diagnosis quickly. Mr. Manget, do you have a particular problem? with the comments of the minister in the presidency? Or do you think that the government's stance to be firm on illegal mining is the correct language? NUM would like to uh, put it categorically clear that we don't support the statement. In fact, it is inhuman and irresponsible of the minister to utter such words when the people are trapped underground. You must recall, Koli, uh, maybe one should highlight this important factor, that after, in, in 1884, after the discovery of diamond uh, in Northern Cape, uh, people were mining manually uh, during that era. There were no machines, nothing, and mining was not regulated by that particular time. So people were doing uh, mining manually using chisels and everything until the zipping, the, the, the zip. And then someone uh, called Sisselton Rhodes, he went abroad and then to bring back uh, the machine to pump uh, those waters. And then after that, that is where now this regulation of the mining started. So what is wrong with the African people when they want to go back to their primitive mining uh, stage? to say we want to mine ourselves because we've got abundance of gold, we've got abundance of chrome, we've got abundance of all sorts of minerals in South Africa. 
what is happening now, South Africa remains uh, with uh, ghost towns. Uh, Chinese and Europeans are uh, coming to, to South Africa. They take gold, they take everything. As we speak only now, I can tell you, I can cite, if you look at chrome, we are no longer having smelters, which are smelting chrome in South Africa. If you can list them, yeah. I don't think you'll arrive at five. Because what is happening now is that Chinese are doing illegal mine in South Africa. If now the minister like Nchaben is saying people are criminals, who are they selling that particular product to? Yes, yeah, so you see that um, there are really different uh, perspectives to the analysis of this whole Zama Zama issue. And it's really, you know, important that we get a kind of like a balanced analysis of how the multiple uh, perspectives in South Africa analyze the problem so that we can get to a really sustainable solution to this whole issue. But now let's quickly listen to what Dr. Peter Grunwald argues is the root causes and the origins and how he diagnoses this problem of the Zamazamas, especially coming from the fact that he was once the you know mayor of Stillfontein, where this problem of the Zamazamas, this present problem with the stock Zamazamas in underground in the shaft, actually uh, you know is 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 dominant in the news at the moment. You were a mayor of Stillfontein back in 1988. And I'm wondering what you think about the activities that have just kept the media zeitgeist busy these past two weeks about the illicit mining activities that are happening there, given that you were once a mayor in that town. Yes, it's quite a complex situation. Uh, and you're quite right. I'm an uh, inhabitant of uh, Stillfontein for the last 37 years. The Zama Zama problem is coming a long way. In fact, in 2009, I served on the Portfolio Committee of Police, and I complained about the Zamazamas in the area, and the then chair of the Portfolio Committee asked me about what is a Zamazama. He didn't even know what Zamazamas were. And the reason why I put it on the agenda is that members of the community, specifically from the Kuma community, came to me and said, uh, said to me, we have a problem with these Zamazamas, because when we go to work, they go and they rape our wives and our daughters, and we must do something about them. And because of the fact that far the majority of them are actually uh, illegal foreigners, they said they can't identify them. Uh, then I don't even talk about housebreaking and uh, that sort of thing. So there is an other side of the coin when it comes to Zama Zamas. But the problem is that was already reported, but nothing was really done. And the other problem you have, that it is said when it comes to corruption, you have high-ranking police and even politicians as part of the network of the Zama Zamas. And I said that if you want to solve the problem, well, you should have acted long ago when it started. I can say that I saw with my own eyes because in Stillfontein there are three old mines. It's a Stillfontein mine, Huffelsfontein mine, and the Hartbeersfontein mine. I saw with my own eyes the Hartbeersfontein office block was broken down within a month, level with the ground. And if I say level with the ground, I mean they were not one brick on another brick. They uh, dig up all the cables and the whole area. I moved between them. Uh, they didn't, they're not scared about anything, or I went to someone there washing gold and everything, or out what, so we're writing, uh, uh, going right at the moment. He said to me, it's 80 rand, uh, not sure whether it's uh, per gram or per 100 grams or whatever the case may be. So it is a huge problem. And if you ask me about the Zama Zamas, I say part of the problem of South Africa is that at the moment, we are busy with crisis management. Let's take, for instance, the food poisoning. If the local municipalities did their job properly and there are health regulations and they ensure that that being applied to food outlets, all of them, whether it's a spasa shop or not, mm -hmm. we wouldn't have had this situation. But in South Africa, I say that we're going to have the one 
crisis after the other now because it's actually like, uh, uh, how can you say, you've waited too long and now the results are getting out of hand. Let's take the m uh, construction mafia, for instance, the water mafia. Uh, I want to say there are so many mafias and they are all interlinked in some other way. But if the law was enforced from the start, you wouldn't have had this escalation of these mafias. And I mean, the Zama Zamas, it's part of the gold mafia, if you can want to put it that way. And yes, of course, they are illegal mining. And I say that they must go to the source where they are selling the gold and the minerals. Because I'm also told that there you have people involved in high positions in politics uh, and all that sort of things. If you cut that off, uh, then you don't need to wait for them to come out of the shaft. And let me also just explain, it's not the main shaft where they go in. They, all mines have ventilation shafts. So it's a, a very smaller sort of, can I say, a shaft uh, for ventilation in the mine. And let's take Stillfontein Mine, for instance. Stillfontein Mine closed down in 1989. It's an old mine. Uh, the mining methods were still of the old form of mining. And I am told, I've never been a miner, but I am told that then they left certain pillars underground to prevent the sinking of, uh, for, from above. So what is happening now, these pillars hold some of the very rich, uh, can I say, gold uh, offsets in those pillars and now they're mining out those pillars and now you can imagine what is going the ceiling is start falling in and i live in stillfontein especially in winter you get more can i say uh, it's not an earthquake or anything like that that sort of thing uh, in afrikaans we call it trillings uh, that is going uh, uh, is happening there it's not that we get sinkholes or anything because it's quite far below. But that is the other side of the Zamazamas and we must address the problem. Brilliant, guys. So um, I think it's, it's quite worrisome. It's really worrisome. And I think I'll just go through quickly two reports I found um, from the Daily Maverick that tries to explain a little bit more on this whole issue so that we can really have an understanding of the, you know, the depth and the importance of this problem and how, why, you know, it should actually be at the, you know, tip of um, the, the government's policy to be able to solve. So I think I found a really interesting uh, report on um, on 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 Daily Maverick about when Inshaveni said that she, uh, you know the government will smoke out these uh, Zamazamas. So it says that the report argued that as many as four thousand illegal miners are somehow stuck on the ground near the northwest town of Stillfontein. All right, and then this minister in the presidency, Kumbutso Kum, Inshaveni, actually told the media on Wednesday that. She, we will smoke them out. That was the rhetoric from the government. I think this was really offensive to many people anyway. But um, this uh, reporter here now argues, he asks that, but just how many need to be smoked out by the surrender and staff strategy under what was now called Operation Vala Umgodi, all right, which seeks to disrupt illegal mining, um, you know. So it says that uh, this region here in Steelfontein is a hive of Zamazama activity, all right, and um, Brigadier Sabata Mokam Bone, who is actually a spokesperson for the Northwest, Northwest Saps, actually said that there was a volunteer who actually went down the mine shaft all right and he reported that there were an estimated four thousand zamazamas trapped below the ground that's really dangerous because if anything happens you know to that cave in which uh dr peter gronwood speaks about these are four thousand lives you know they're stuck deep deep in the ground i mean like that's really really dangerous and 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 if they are armed with ak-47s and all that i mean that's that's <laughs> i think that's a really problematic um you know 
kind of like situation for a country to be in uh you know uh, you know in this kind of situation so i think that's for me is really is really new and really a really interesting problem so i, I don't know really but anyway, he says that, um, you know, this volunteer tried to do a head count and he was still trying to confirm the exact number that was trapped. All right. And he says that neighboring mines were also indicated to have to the, uh, that their neighboring mines have indicated that they are unable to help as this particular shaft is unsafe. And we see that Peter Grunwald speaks about this particular shaft that, you know, it appears that it's uh, there's, there's, there's gold trapped in the kind of like cave in holding this shaft up. And that's where what the Zamazamas are after, the gold in that particular one. And it's really dangerous because if it eventually caves in, it means that these 4,000 uh, miners will be stuck permanently and probably even uh you know um their fate would come to a really unfortunate end on the ground because of this um you know search for gold and it's really uh, unfortunate it says that it seems doubtful that any approaching it seems doubtful that anything approaching an accurate roll call could have been undertaken in such circumstances, all right? And that, you know, two mining security analysts, they actually doubted that there were 4,000 Zamazamas in that shaft, but argued that probably 2,000 2, would be possible. And that because of, and his, uh, this analyst suggests here that 4,000 might be uh, kind, of like a, kind of like a hype to ensure that if humanitarian aid is sent below, there will be food supplies for some illegal miners to remain on the ground to continue their ply with dangerous but cash spinning trade all right so this analyst argues that that number 4000 was actually given probably by some of those guys stuck on the ground so that there can be more food aid to help them last uh you know under the ground there it says that zamazama spend weeks and even months on the ground and then they, re they rely on supplies from the surface to stay alive all right and um, as you can, as you could hear from the unions, uh, these union leaders, it says that Shaveni's, uh, you know, remarks to smoke them out was actually inhumane and distasteful. I'm yet to really go conduct a research from the perspective of the ANC and the government why they think that you know these illegal miners should be should be smoked out because um, I really don't know why why they see that problem why they see it from a problem. But anyway, this uh, report says that the price of gold has actually been scaling records high this year all right providing an incentive for a selling swelling army of unemployed men mostly from lesotho and mozambique and the old labor sending areas for south africa's gold industry as we heard from one of the union leaders um john cecil rhodes i think probably there were lots of the laborers from him from lesotho and mozambique at this time who really were able to see the potential of the you know gold trade from these mines and you know conducted artisanal mining and before things were then regulated so it's an old problem old south african problem that seems to be coming back and that's one of the things i usually speak about south africa's uh problems and you know most of them are actually issues that were actually underguarded in the dis disturbing past in south africa and they seem to be coming back into the present and until those issues you know from the past are ratified i think they will continue to permeate because um you know there's still a lot of unre irreconcilable i don't know if they're irreconcilable anyway i think they're reconcilable but the political will to reconcile some of these historical um events that actually shaped what South Africa's history then became, especially from 1994, the post-democratic era uh, for the nation state of South Africa, you know, many still remain, you know, um, unattended to. And this is why we see uh, a lot of coming, coming back of these issues. So it says that uh, many of these labor, you know, Lesotho and Mozambique were the labor sending areas for South Africa's gold industry. And then this took leap. They, they now came and took leap, leap, a leap into the shafts to extract gold, all right? And then it often winds up getting laundered in refineries in Dubai and in India. So this is kind of like the trade, um, you know, networks that when the Zamazamas, probably the ones who engage in artisanal mining, are able to mine gold in their yeah, kind of like um, what many have called primitive ways, they end up selling this um, raw gold to refineries in Dubai and India to, to get them, uh, you know, refined. But anyway, I saw also another really interesting report that actually gave more flesh to to how we can understand the problem of this whole Zamazama. It's actually titled here that, you know, that the big profits from illegal gold mining uh, surged to the criminals at the top 
who then launder the precious metal into clean assets and that they are the masterminds who should be smoked and not those zamazamas on the ground all right so the report argues that it is the guys at the top who these zamazamas sell the raw mined gold to who should be smoked and not the zamazamas uh, in this instance so let's just try to really understand what it means what this guy means here so he says that uh, the world gold council actually you know just uh, published a report which is actually a salient reminder for south africans that illegal gold mining is a vast global industry and it actually forms from a complex web of transnational organized crime all right so there's a really massive mafia around this whole gold illegal gold mining and and all of that so it says that artisanal and small-scale gold mining comprises about 20% of all gold supply in the world and 80% of employment in that sector. All right. So artisanal and small scale mining. And that's the kind of miners that we see from these guys in Maputo and Mozambique. They're artisanal miners. All right. And this their skill, this skill they have as artisanal miners then comprises of 20 percent of all the gold supply that actually, you know, we have in this world, in our world today and 80 percent of the employment in that gold mining industry all right artisanal and small scale gold miners so that's why you see the zamazamas are die hard they rather get stuck in that in that on the ground as much as four thousand people to because that's the that's the employment they know especially because they're affiliated in this industry that's the form of employment they know it's artisanal mining and small scale mining all right so it argues that both big profits they surge to the criminals at the top who launder the precious metal into clean assets and these are the guys who should be smoked it argues that you know um south africa's mines once employed 500,000 foreign workers all right and that number according to the last available data that was found now stood as a 2022 to 35,000 so we know that these mines in South Africa once employed 500,000 foreign workers. You can imagine how much employment that, that industry provided at the time. But as of 2022, from 500,000, we have 30,000. So we almost have a number of almost a 400 and there are about 65,000 people that have become unemployed because of this shift and these unemployed people i suspect are what we now call the zama zamas because in their bid to try to get back into an employment because they've seen and tasted the possibilities in this gold industry and had a, a taste of a job as artisanal miners and gold miners you know they they struggle to to live in a way that you know end up that in a way that they end up becoming unemployed despite the presence of these mines in South Africa. So we had an employment rate of 500,000 workers in this industry. Now by 2022, we see only 30,000 are actually employed. So that's actually a really massive decline. And probably that's why a lot of these, uh, you know, former unemployed workers now got to become what we now call today Zamazamas. It says that remittances from the wages of Lesotho nationals working in South African mines amounted in 1987 to an astonishing 236% of the country's GDP. Now, they equal 21% of the GDP, according to, the, to a World Bank data, which was called a remittance shock without parallel in modern global economic history. So the remittances from these guys in the mines from Lesotho, when they would get uh, income and send back home to Lesotho from South Africa, it comprised of 236% of the GDP of South Africa, all right? But by 2022 now, especially as this data, since we have a drop from 500,000, uh, you know, employed in that industry to 30,000 as of 2022, there was what was called a remittance shock. So from 236% of South Africa's GDP to 21% of the GDP, that's the effect of the drop in employment and remittances from nationals, foreign nationals from Lesotho and Mozambique, sending money back home to support their families. Okay, and so this is these are kind of like the root causes that are actually driving this problem and increasing this whole issue with Zama Zamas and making them really die hard because regardless of how much they are being kind of like persecuted and arrested by SAPs, they still seem not to be able to get off that shackle that kind of like uh, the former glory of this industry so to speak and so that's why they really die hard you know to the fact that they will continue to be there and stay stuck regardless of what happens 
It says that the Dezamazamas don't move money around in a transparent way. In the mountain kingdom, it says cash is king. And as the World Gold Council report notes, artisanal miners provide direct and indirect support to many others. So it says that a lot of the money they make from their really hard work and dangerous trade is taken back to Lesotho in cold, hard cash. It says that a lifeline of support for poor rural communities. So that money they make from that mine is a really massive support for many poor communities in Lesotho. All right. And it says that the rand do the rands do not have to be exchanged as the big five currency is legal tender in Lesotho. So I, I, I think that, you know, they can actually spend rand in Lesotho. So that pile, that money they make in South Africa doesn't necessarily have to be exchanged into any currency. So it's the, the money they make in South Africa ends up getting to Lesotho in really hard cash. And you see, that's why these guys are die hard because it's a really uh, promising kind of like venture, so to speak, for them to support their, their poor rural communities in Lesotho. And actually it says that, the big five currency is legal tender in Lesotho and it's pegged to one to one to the Lesotho Loti. All right. So in other words, yeah, the currency in Lesotho is here is the Loti. But then it says that there is, there's a big five currency, which is a legal tender also in Lesotho and it's pegged one to one. But anyway, it says that the prevailing view in South Africa is that Zamazamas are violent criminals who, in memorable words of last week's minister in the presidency, Kumbusu Nshaveni, said that they need to be smoked out. Now, these Zamazamas are certainly linked to violence. According to this report, all right, it says that the Zama, Zamazamas are linked to violence. And this was actu actually, I was surprised when I listened to a uh, SAP spokesperson, one uh, really eloquent lady, she spoke about how that these guys are armed to the teeth and all that. I was really su surprised. So you can imagine if there are lots of these AK-47s on the ground with these guys, as much as 4,000. That's an army, okay? That's an army. It says that the Zamazamas are certainly linked to violence including armed attacks on mining operations. And aside from disused shafts, they gain access to active mines run by publicly listed companies by intimidating security staff. Now, there was a senior mine union official who described uh, it, he described it this way. He says, if you are a security personnel responsible for access to a mine, someone might show you show you pictures of your wife and children and say something along the lines of nice family you have there it would be too bad if something happened to them so that's kind of like the, the way this they argue that the zamazama strengthen uh the security uh people placed at uh you know to secure these places and at the end of the day you see that the security security gets up and ends up getting porous and they have their way into the mines it then says that, but lower or mid-level dons, it calls these guys dons, they carry out most of the dirty work. It says that the men below ground in steel fountain, like tens of thousands of others, are the descendants of the men who once toiled in the South Africans' minds for a pittance. So you see what I what I said, that this, this problem is simply a problem from the past that is actually recurring in the present, okay? It's actually argued that these Zamazamas are descendants of those who probably worked for uh, John Cecil Rhodes, uh, you know, in South Africa's, um, you know, history, and, you know, who actually have now carried on this tradition of artisanal mining you see and they're really stuck hard and able to think of an alternative way of um, employment and all that that's the tradition that they inherited from their former descendants their fathers and grandfathers and they have to continue and so that's what this whole zama zama problem is actually pointing to it says that view through that perspective another picture emerges men whose fathers grandfathers and so on were brutally exploited under apartheid by south africa's mining industry are still being used and abused but it is not a racist state in collaboration with legitimate corporations engaging labor practices that were frankly criminal who are making who are still milking their muscles but after being dispatched to the dustbin of history by south africa's mining industry the zamazamas are now prey to criminals operating in the shadows rather than in the open and their rural key their rural kin back home still depends on their wages. So in other words, it argues that the face of the of the ruling class, so to speak, in this industry has shifted. Previously was the, you know, kind of like 
uh, what he called legitimate corporations during South Africa's apartheid um, era. And, you know, most of these guys were actually employed in these mines, you know, and they were given a pittance. But now that South Africa has become a democratic state, a nation state, so to speak, from 1994 onwards, it argues that now the face of those, those um, you know, leaders at the top of this whole business are now dark, all right? It's, they, they are criminals operating in the shadows. So in other words, they still sort of like indirectly employ these Zamazamas to continue the process of extracting gold that was in the same way as in the, on, during the apartheid era. But now, uh, you know, they, they, these people, we do not know them. They don't, we don't know who they are. There's a kind of like industrial network that then uh, manages the whole trade now in the post-independence uh, era. And that the Zamazamas are still the victims. They still receive a pittance despite the fact that the face of the whole industry has changed. All right. So that's a really interesting way to understand what's going on. So finally, it says that instead of displaying a callous indifference to their plight, a certain amount of empathy can actually be shown to these men. And this is actually an advice to the government given by this reporter here. It says that because of their historic, their hard historical circumstances, they spent weeks or months at a time on the ground in really difficult conditions. It says that the, the, this is not something that anyone does by choice. Who else are they supposed to, what else are they supposed to do? Are they supposed to herd goats in the mountains or beg on the streets of Maseru? Uh, so um, in, in conclusion, anyway, it says that the World Goat Council report recommends that efforts should be made to formalize artisanal mining. And this is not original, but so long as there is gold to extract, someone is going to take a chance. And that's why the guy from the National Union of Mine Workers in South Africa is really angry that the Chinese, they actually engage in artisanal mining illegally. But when they are caught, the government calls them investors and i'll be making a video soon where uh you know uh, chinese one of the i think the chinese ambassador actually gave um a gift to the sports industry and uh getty mckenzie made a really interesting uh, speech in that but then it kind of like frames the two-sidedness of uh, Chinese investing. So in other words, while the National Union of Mine Workers argues that when these Chinese people engage in illegal mining in South Africa, and I think a lot of the Ghanaians have been complaining about the Chinese uh, uh, mining gold illegally and they messed up the mines in, in Ghana. When, when this same thing happens in South Africa, um, the union workers, the National Union of mine workers boss, as you heard in the video, calls them investors. It says that the government calls them investors. But when the blacks from uh, Maputo and Mozambique, who are actually descendants of the mine workers, especially during the apartheid era, engage in the same artisanal mining, they are called illegal miners or zamazamas. So this is actually the two sides of the argument that many um, people, actually, I, I suspect, in South Africa hold for this same problem and how to go about solving it. And it's really difficult uh, for the government. I really don't know how the government will grapple with this one, but it's actually a really, uh, you know, critical problem that needs to be uh, understood uh, well. So it says that against the backdrop of the steel fontaine siege, the bottom line is that there are two things to keep in mind. The first one is that is that the top brass who pulls the strings are living in luxury on the surface. The second is that the Zamazamas are just the latest wave of men from underdeveloped countries such as Lesotho and in Mozambique who have been compelled to go on the ground by dint of their limited economic choices. Resolving the Zamazama problem will require jailing the bosses and providing economic opportunities, jailing the broad bosses and providing economic uh, opportunities to these Zamazama. So, in other words, it's a very complex problem that shouldn't just be, in a way, focused on just who is the Zamazama and smoking out the Zamazama. There's a there's a, a circle, a ring, a sort of trade network that goes on. And if these um, Zamazamas have to be stopped from going on the ground, uh, the directive has to be stopped as well from that is being given from the top, according to this report, that then forces these Zamazamas to sort of like seek a pittance by get, getting on the ground and, you know, extracting this uh, limited amount of gold for which they are really paid to be able then to take care of the family. So we see the whole problem still lies around the economic factors and the unemployment issue that South Africa is suffering from, I think, 33% at the moment and all of that. So it's a really complex problem.
problem that smoking out the zamazamas might not be sufficient enough because that's actually just the smoke screen. There's the deeper uh, driving factors that end up, you know, pushing the zamazamas to the ground and the whole problem should be engaged uh, in a much more robust, systematic way. So, but it's really interesting. I really enjoyed this video. What do you guys think about um, Peter Grunwald's speech here and also the speech from the National Union? The whole analysis, let's have a really robust discussion in the, in the comments. So share your thoughts. What do you think about this whole zamazama issue in South Africa? Share your thoughts in the comments.